Good morning, Ed and Dave here from Crystal Clear Aquatics. We're going to start on another project. Now this is a little bit different from the norm. We're not making a pond. We are installing a water feature. We're also battling the rain by the look of it. So this lovely little section of the garden here is just crying out for a water feature, a very formal setting. Having these quadrants of cobbles around the outside lends itself very nicely to having some lighting illuminating this feature in the centre. Uh, and my clients who I'm working for have already purchased a nice big solid sandstone sphere and a reservoir and a grid so we can get this set up. So only be a little video of this one, but I think it'd be quite nice to show you the concept of a pebble pool of a water feature and the work involved in rigging up such a feature. So this is the water feature that we're going to be installing. Lovely great big sandstone sphere. Quite a hefty thing. And definitely a two or a three person job to get this carried and put into position. I've got Ollie in the lab helping me today. Good boy. Very good. But this, with water flowing over the stone and revealing the colours and the strata, is going to make a lovely feature. Looks like one of those giant atlas balls that the world's strongest man would lift. Whoa, there's no way I'm going to lift that. So power supply for the feature is going to be taken from an existing armoured cable which stops up behind the mirror here. So to be able to get cables from the feature and from the surrounding quadrants where the lighting is going to go, Dave is going to be doing some tunnelling underneath each section so that we can meet up in one area and then from there run all the cables through a conduit underneath the brickwork path, terminating in the border over here, keeping it nice and discreet visibly from the property. You know, any cables and, and boxes on this side are going to be a lot more visible from the house than they are from this side. So although it would be a much easier route and a straighter route to run everything into this border, from a cosmetic point of view, it's going to be much nicer if we can get it over there. So that's the plan. If you've been following any of our other videos, you'll know that we have just completed a very large pond installation, a lovely formal square pond, uh, which was quite a large job and took a lot of weeks of hard work. So doing something smaller like this is a bit of a luxury for today. So all the cobbles have been lifted from the, the outer quadrants and Dave's been doing a great job of tunnelling between each section. So each individual light sitting in each one of these corners is going to have its flex channeled through into this central section where the water feature is going to go. And then from that, all of the cables are going to run off to where the power supply will be fitted up onto the wall over there. Now as part of this little project, there's a little hard standing over here with a bird bath. And to tie in the water feature with this section, we're also going to be laying cobbles over here. Now with this concrete base, we don't need to worry about laying a membrane uh, to stop any weeds from coming through. I can just sprinkle cobbles directly on top of this. There was a layer of moss and some old leaf litter and needles from the nearby trees that had to be cleared up. And now I'm going to scatter some cobbles around this area. But when you're laying cobbles, it's always a good idea to have two or three different sizes. A standard kind of Scotch cobble like this just on its own is very boring. So it's nice if you can have two or three bigger feature pieces of stone kind of breaking through and then a, a layer of much smaller stones, which I think are more decorative, but also importantly, if you're going to be walking on it, bigger cobbles like this can be quite difficult to walk on and a smaller one much easier. So, so what I'll do is sprinkle a layer of bigger stones around the bird bath, around the feature, and then grade it out a little bit with some smaller pebbles around the side. And that's also good advice if you're creating a beach around a pond. To keep it looking natural and to keep it looking nice, you don't want to use one size cobble. Use two, three or four or even more size cobbles grading right out to a fine gravel if needs be. And it'll make it look a lot more natural. Now start off with the bigger cobbles and then work your way down to the smaller ones, which you can then sort of fill the gaps and sprinkle on top around the bigger stones. So that's a mix of three or four different sizes of cobbles that have gone into this. I'll just finish off hand placing a couple of larger ones, make sure that they are visible around this inner ring and then kind of 
blend in some of the gaps with a few of the smaller ones, just to make it look like it's all kind of mixed in a little bit. Now these cobbles are very dusty. They need a really good rinse. But I'll just get this spread out a little bit more neatly, give it a rinse, and job done. A nice quick, easy way of dressing a surface and making a little bit more of a feature out of it. So it's when they're wet that I think cobbles look their best. That's when they show off their lovely colour and markings. So on a nice wet day or a, or a damp, dewy morning, it looks lovely, but it does need a rinse. It's very dusty, this. And it'll probably need two or three rinses before the dust has got right down to the base. When you're doing stuff like this, I'd probably try and refrain from walking on it as much as possible if you can help it. Otherwise, you're permanently going to be scraping the cobbles back to sort of fill in your footprints as you've walked over it. Job done, over to the water feature. So I'm just rigging up the light set, as always, a Waza kit, tried and tested and uh, reliable, so I trust this. And as always, I'm not affiliated with the Waza at all, but you know, I do use their stuff a lot. Now, if you watch many of my videos, a lot of the lighting sets I use are the Lunaqua Power LED light sets. Fantastic LED light, but far, far too powerful for this kind of application. So I'm using a smaller, cheaper and less powerful LED, this is called the Lunacro 3. So this sits kind of in the middle of the range with the Awaza light sets. They do a classic LED, which is kind of the basic set. The Lunacro 3, which is the middle of the road. And then the power LEDs, which are the more expensive, bigger LED light sets. And these are nice, they're bright enough. Uh, each light comes with five meters of flex, which then plugs into a weatherproof transformer that sits outside. And then from that, you've got one flex which you'll wire up to your power supply, either an outdoor socket, a switch box, or some other supply. Now, before all these cables go through the conduit, I want to test the lights to make sure they all work. Because if we go to all the effort of feeding the cables through the conduit, which is quite a, a job in itself, and then plug it in and find one of the lights don't work, that'll be a real pain. So I'm just gonna spend a few minutes now sticking a plug on the end, plugging them in, and see what happens. Each light, it's got a little bracket with a pivot that you can articulate and lock into place and then it slides on a nice weighted base. Now these can be used both in or out of water, fully submersed. I like using lights like this even if it's for an external application because they're reliable enough to be fully submersed permanently which means that they're going to be no problem at all outside getting rained on. So often I'll find uh, garden lights that have been used outside which have failed if they've been wired up to same sort of supply as the, as the pond with life support and the lights throw the power out, that's gonna cause issues for the pond itself. So again, always use reliable equipment outside if it's got any potential to get wet. What I also like about these is that that base is weighted. So if you're dropping it into the pond, you can simply position it, angle it into place and away you go. Amazingly, most lights float because they're sealed and obviously there's a certain amount of air inside there as well. And a lot of the bases that come supplied with them aren't weighted either. So you then have to start piling up stones and cobbles or you might have a shallow tray that you fill up with gravel, which I think when you're spending a few, a few quid on a light uh, is a bit thoughtless. So having a weighted bake like this makes installation so much easier. So all three lights plug into a little three-way splitter via two pin and a threaded collar to clamp it into position. And then that one final two pin connection joins up to the transformer. Now this is a weatherproof transformer, IP67 rated. So that means it's weatherproof, it can sit outside, but it's not submersible. So it shouldn't be underwater, but equally it shouldn't be somewhere positioned that might pool with water. If you're gonna bury it, then potentially that might end up getting saturated with water and sitting in a puddle, which isn't gonna do it any good. So ideally have this raised above ground, mounted to a wall or positioned somewhere where it's freely draining. Let's plug that in. And there we go. One, two, three. Now these are LEDs, but it's a lovely warm light simulating um, the old sort of traditional halogen bulbs. That looks lovely with moving water. It'll look great in the garden. If any of my Maltese viewers you might recognise some of these. Mm, one of my favourites. 
So Dave has successfully tunneled through from each section where the power supply is going to be connected up. And we've got a length of conduit running from each corner into the center here where the feature is going to run. And that conduit is allowing the cable to run through from this section into the center where it will then meet up with the larger inch and a half conduit so that all the cables can then continue off to the power supply. So another important um, consideration is the depth of the reservoir on the grid here. I want to make sure that the, the grid, which is covered in cobbles and stones to conceal it, ends up at or slightly below the brick surface level. And so to accommodate a layer of cobbles and the grid, we have to make sure that this is actually a few inches below ground level. There's a lot of weight on this reservoir from that ball. I mean, that's got to weigh 100 kilos or more. Um, so I'm sitting the reservoir on top of a 600 square, 22 mil Indian sandstone paving slab, just to help displace the weight a little bit and making sure that the ground is well tamped beneath. So I'm just putting the slab in now, making sure that it's level and making sure that it's down at the right depth. So that's the, the base stone in position, nice and level. I've bedded it down on a, on a small layer of builder sand and kind of given the stone a bit of a shimmy just to make sure it's bedded in properly and it's nice and level. The reservoir is going to sit on top and that's a sufficient depth but it's just a bit lower than the edging so that the cobbles sitting on here will end up flush with the brickwork. And now I'm going to backfill around the reservoir here just to make sure that this is nice and stable and isn't going to go anywhere before we end up putting the, the stone, the feature on, which obviously is quite heavy. Now, this is worth a mention. This was supplied as a kit, water feature, reservoir and grid, and the pump and the lighting. Uh, and this is kind of a generic standard thing that you'll find in a lot of garden centres and a lot of online um, stockist of water features. It will just be a, a standard kit. And quite often some of the components that come with the kit aren't always the best kind of things. Now in this particular scenario, I wish that the kit had incorporated a larger reservoir. And that's important for a couple of reasons. One, you want to try to maximise the amount of water retention as possible. Um, water features will always splash, they'll have an increased evaporation rate. Um, and if you're running your feature quite regularly, the last thing you want to have to do is to keep topping up the reservoir regularly or risk your pump running dry and making an annoying noise and potentially burning out the pump. And the other very important thing to make sure is, is that the bigger the reservoir, the bigger the catchment. So any splashes you've got from that water feature are still gonna return back into the reservoir. Now in this particular setup, the sphere, the ball, is almost the same diameter as the reservoir. Now we can get away with this because that particular feature isn't designed to splash too much. It's a very small trickle of water above the stone and then the water will almost kind of cling to the stone as it spreads around. So it should return back into the reservoir with minimal splash. Um, but if I was to be providing a feature, a component set like this, I would have included a larger reservoir. Now, the other thing also to bear in mind is that the, the grid or the support for the feature is strong enough to support the weight. Um, as I say, that, that solid ball is gonna weigh about 100 kilos or so. So it's really important that this is strong enough to be able to withstand that. Now it's pretty standard for most grids to have a removable hatch so you can access the pump for maintenance in the future. That's great. Again, unfortunately, in this particular setup, um, the, the ball itself is going to be sitting and probably uh, weighing this grid down. So in the future, when the pump clogs and needs to be cleaned, that sphere, that ball is going to have to be tipped up a little bit to allow access to this. Um, there's no way around that, unfortunately, without replacing all of this. Uh, which isn't scope uh, for this job. Now, one simple modification that you could do to increase the catchment area if the reservoir is too small or your feature does splash too much is that you can include a piece of pond liner, a square of pond liner with a circle cut out in the centre, making sure that the ground slopes up just a little bit and that pond liner sitting over the top with the inside section sat inside the reservoir and then the grid sitting on top of that is going to help any splashes work their way back down via gravity into the reservoir. But again, as I say in this setup, we shouldn't have to use anything like that. Now water feature is generally a very simple way of getting the sound of water in the garden. And any form of water feature, particularly what's called a pebble pool like this, uh, is simply three components. The reservoir and grid, the pump and the water feature. And as long as you've got a large enough reservoir and a sturdy enough grid, 
and a strong enough pump, you can make you know, anything into a water feature, an upturned pot or an amphora on its side, a drilled rock or a pebble, a stack of stones on top of each other, a statue of some form, um, and anything like that would work quite happily and integrate itself in a pebble pool kit like this with just those three simple components. Um, I often say to people if they're looking for a water feature, the most important thing is to find a feature they like the look of. And once you've found that, we can then work back and provide a suitable base and grid and a suitable pump to power it. But the hardest thing is to try and find something that you like. There's an awful lot of kind of twee rubbish. I mean, if you like squirrels and uh, little rats and forest animals with water dribbling down them, then great, that's for you, but it's not for me. Um, I like this sort of very classic sphere is a nice feature. Um, monoliths, slate columns. Um, you can get some nice stainless steel and copper features, or you can't go wrong with just a nice classic uh, statue of some form. Some attractive nubile lady with some water dribbling down the side could often look quite nice. So, on with this construction. Get this area backfilled with soil, and then we'll see if we can get that beast of a rock sitting on top and see how it looks. One other thing to worth mention. Although, of course, we want to try to get this as level as possible, it's not essential that this is absolutely dead level. The grid itself, the reservoir, this isn't going to be seen anyway. So even if it was completely on the P, the feature itself could be then propped up and made sure it was level. Um, but the reservoir would go unseen and you'd never know. Um, of course, you want to try to make sure it's level so that you can maximise water volume in the feature. Uh, and having this level means that levelling the statue or the obelisk or any other water feature you're sitting on it uh, is a little easier to do. But don't go too mad in trying to make sure that that's absolutely bang on. The other thing that's important to note is um, that again, because the reservoir is concealed and unseen, it doesn't matter if this is off centre. Once this whole area is filled up with stones and cobbles, this isn't going to be seen. So the only important thing is making sure that the water feature sits central to this visible open area here and that all the water returns back into the reservoir. So the reservoir we filled up with water just to add some weight to that so that's not going to move anywhere and all around it has been filled with soil and some old cobbles and stones and bits and pieces and just compacted down so that's not going to move and that's also important you know cobbles are quite expensive a 20-25 kilo bag of cobbles here in the UK are now selling for sort of six or seven pounds so we want to try to minimize exactly how much of that expensive material we're using. Uh, so obviously soil in the garden is free. I've filled this up a little bit more with soil so that we're using slightly less cobbles, but still making sure we've got a good depth that we're not gonna then reveal the reservoir beneath. All the cables and conduits that are fed into here, we've made sure that the ends are above soil level, that the open conduit has been blocked up with a little bit of felt um, just to stop any soil and rubbish from falling in there so that it can be used in the future. And I wanted to make sure that all the cables weren't buried in the soil, any of the loose ends, but were sitting just underneath the membrane that we're gonna lay down next before the cobbles then go down. So that means it's quite easy in the future. If we need to find something, all we've got to do is move the cobbles aside and pull the membrane back and we'll reveal the conduits and the cables. Good, right. Let's try and lift up that stone, make sure we don't have any trip hazards. Big bowling ball. It's massive, isn't it? Lovely. So, as I feared, you're not going to be able to access that hatch without moving the sphere. Yeah, but it's okay. It's, oh, okay, possibly. I wouldn't say it's quite central. It does need to move this way a little bit, doesn't it? But it's easy enough to move this in the future just to grab that pump. And because this is all covered in cobbles, there's very little debris and muck which is gonna get down into the sump and block the pump in the first place. Now the next job is the pump itself has a nifty little built-in light these are great, although they don't tend to be the most reliable of lights. And it probably won't be very long before one of those LEDs stops working, but they can be replaced in the future. But all of that is gonna get fed through the center of the stone and then come back out the other side so we can get plumbed into the pump and the two pin adapter plugged into the transformer. Right, wet test complete. Before we go any further, I wanted to get this wired up, plumbed in, 
and tested to make sure that the pump was working as well and to make sure that it wasn't splashing too much. Now there is some adjustment on the pump. There's a little adapter so that you can increase or decrease the flow. This isn't quite full whack, it's turned down a little bit, but it's sufficient to fill the stone entirely to create a bit of a plume and a bit of sound, but it's not splashing. All the water is hugging the sphere and returning back into the reservoir nicely, so that works really well. Um, the reservoir itself isn't dead central, but the important thing is, is that the sphere is, and I'm using the four paths, stepping well away and making sure that the sphere is kind of central to each path so that it looks even and central. And so the next thing now is going to be to fill this entirely with cobbles. The grid itself has got quite large holes, so I should be putting bigger cobbles first around this and then some smaller ones around the top and around the sides. Um, you may notice I've got some wedges under here. I wanted to lift the stone ever so slightly so that we didn't lose any of this beneath the cobbles, um, as this is the feature. But also, pipe work and cables and bits and pieces that are underneath this, I didn't want to risk snagging any of them. So I wanted to have the stone elevated slightly off of the, off of the deck, off of the grid. So I've just chopped up a couple of sections of Indian sandstone slab to make four wedges and slid those underneath to hold it up. And it's nice and secure as it is, but once we've got cobbles under there as well, that's not going anywhere. So we've put a little piece of permeable weed membrane or fleece matting down, just to help stop any weeds from growing through here. And then the bigger cobbles that are gonna go over the grid to cover these holes, I'm gonna rinse off here away from the grid. These are very, very dusty, very milky. So if we give them a bit of a rinse here away from the reservoir, thank you Dave, that's gonna prevent this from getting really, really mucky and dusty. And what will happen is for quite some time, that plume of water coming through here will just look horrible. So by rinsing them off first and then positioning the stones, that will help to ensure that this water stays nice and clean. So I've just been going around and filling up the final borders here with some cobbles and giving them a good rinse. And that's it for this job. Um, as you can see, installing a water feature like this is very simple and you can quite happily install a pebble pool kit or a feature like this in a day or two comfortably. I think the most challenging aspect of a job like this is trying to find a feature that you like the look of. And once you've found a water feature, working backwards and working out what size pump you need, what size reservoir and grid you need, is all that's required. I've just given the lights a bit of a dummy run to see how they're looking and I think at night time this whole area is going to illuminate and light up nicely and be a real feature and focal point of the garden. But for now, thank you very much for watching. I'm Ed from Crystal Clear Aquatics and I'll see you in the next pond. Mm -hmm.